to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. I'm Kim McClary, President and CEO, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's program, A Conversation with Jason Matheny. For those of you who would like to ask questions today, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen where you can type in your questions. Rachel Kenderdine, our community manager and digital producer, will be managing your questions during the Q&A portion of today's program, which will start in about 35 to 40 minutes. It's now my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Robert Abernathy. In addition to being a longtime member of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall Board of Directors, Bob is the founder and president of the Tech Center. He serves on numerous prestigious boards, including Brookings, the Atlantic Council, John Hopkins, and New America. Hi, Bob. Thank you so much for making today's program possible. Hi, Kim. I'm glad to be here. It's my pleasure today to introduce a remarkable individual who has taken the helm of the RAND Corporation, an organization that has long been at the forefront of shaping global policy and advancing our understanding of the complex issues. Today, as we gather here to welcome the new president of RAND, Jason Matheny, and to celebrate the enduring and fruitful relationship between RAND and the Los Angeles World Affairs Council. It is evident that there are paths have intertwined in a remarkable manner. Over the years, the Los Angeles World Affairs Council has consistently fostered dialogue on critical global issues, providing a platform for engaging minds, and diverse perspectives. And it is within this rich tapestry of intellectual discourse that RAND has played a pivotal role. Notably, the bond between RAND and the council extends even further through the remarkable individuals who have helmed RAND as its presence in recent times. It is our honor to acknowledge that the three immediate past presidents of RAND have all served on the board of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council embodying the deep connection and shared commitment to fostering informed discussions and driving positive change. We salute and appreciate Michael Rich, Jim Thompson, and Don Rice, and welcome Jason Matheny as a new member of our board of directors. Today, we stand at a pivotal juncture as we witness the ascension of a new leader, Jason Matheny, as the president of RAND, with his extensive experience and visionary outlook, he brings a wealth of knowledge and passion to this esteemed position. His background marked by outstanding achievements in the field of technology and national security uniquely positions him to address the complex challenges of our ever evolving global landscape. Under his leadership, we can anticipate the continued advancement of RAND's mission to tackle some of the most pressing issues of our time, leveraging rigorous research and innovative thinking to inform policy decisions uh, worldwide. His deep understanding of the intersections between technology, uh, society, and policy, coupled with his dedication to promoting dialogue and collaboration will undoubtedly propel RAND to new heights. Jason, I'd like to ask you to talk about those new heights that Ray will be propelled to. What direction do you want to take the organization in? What do you want it to accomplish over the next half decade or decade? Thanks, Bob. It's it's great to be here and uh, really grateful to be able to talk about things that we're working on at RAND. Uh, we have five areas that we're prioritizing for growth, um, but you know we work in virtually every policy domain uh, today. That's um, a thousand projects per year, um, a, a thousand uh, projects at any given time across economic policy, social policy, education policy, health policy, national security policy. Virtually every pu public policy uh, question is something that we have some project on. Um, and we're the world's largest policy research organization. So we have a, a lot of breadth and then 
um, a, a pretty broad uh, geographic scope with seven offices around the world. There's five areas that I'm eager to grow, um, and one of them is in technology policy. Um, so this uh, set of developments that we're seeing in artificial intelligence and synthetic biology that will have profound consequences for our economy, uh, for our health, um, for our environment, for the way that we produce energy, for the way we produce materials, uh, for the way that we deliver education. Um, and there are also downside risks. So we need to figure out what sorts of guardrails we can place on these new technologies so that they deliver benefits um, without, uh, without risks. There's four other areas that we're prioritizing at, at RAND. Um, one is inequality and inequity. We still see structural uh, inequalities in the United States and elsewhere in the world where, say, the bottom quarter or so of, of households are not making um, the kind of economic progress or progress in, um, in life expectancy um, that we would expect given the trend lines uh, in uh, in other parts of uh, of our population. So understanding what are the barriers to increases in, in wealth and life expectancy is a big part of uh, the new work that we're doing. A third area is in uh, climate and energy and the security dimensions of those. How do we ensure a robust uh, supply of, of energy and one that's less vulnerable to disruption? Um, and how do we uh, stay on track to meet uh, our, our targets for reductions in, in carbon emissions? How do we make an energy transition uh, that's cost effective and realistic on different time scales? Um, a third, a fourth area is in um, understanding China um, as uh, the second largest economy in the world um, and now the second uh, most populous country in the world after India's uh, recently taking up the number one position, um, China will be an Im important player in this century, ensuring that we can find ways to effectively compete against China economically without a race to the bottom on safety and security. Um, is something that I think will be especially important and figuring out how we can prevent a uh, crisis or catastrophe around Taiwan is, I think, among the world's most uh, pressing problems. Um, and number five is figuring out ways to strengthen democracy, uh, which has increasingly been under attack, um, both due to kind of political paralysis and, par uh, and polarization, not just in the U.S., but in, in other uh, leading democracies and ensuring that the information environment, which ultimately informs democratic process, um, is one whose integrity can be restored. Um, we've seen an erosion of uh, the role of facts and evidence in policy debate, something that we call truth decay uh, at RAND. And it's, I think, multi-causal, um, everything from the role of social media platforms and personalized search to uh, diminished uh, agreement around uh, norms and uh, journalism and civics education. So there's, there's a lot to work on in those five areas on top of everything else that we're doing, but really grateful to have the opportunity to talk about uh, technology policy and in particular artificial intelligence that I think will be so consequential for the decades ahead. Jason, over the last 40 years, there have been numerous important developments in the field of art artificial intelligence and machine learning. What are some of the key milestones and advancements that have been made over these multiple decades? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. I mean, if you think about uh, the progress even in the last several months, it seems pretty stunning, but you're right, fitting it into the context of what's happened over the, the last several decades um, makes, makes for um, an interesting map of how the field has shifted, um, sort of migrated. Um, it started with systems that were, uh, were trained on um, or sort of built with a set of expert judgments. These are called expert systems. So you, the idea was you would try to um, you would try to hand code in um, uh, uh, key knowledge about the world that seemed important to how we make judgments or make decisions. Um, and that just wasn't scalable. Um, it turns out that that was uh, that was something in which you could 
uh, you could produce a system that performed well in a highly specialized domain. But if you wanted to, to uh, move the domain, you'd have to build a completely new system. And so that's not cost effective. Um, and so about a decade ago, there was, uh, um, or a little more, there was uh, a significant move towards, um, uh, towards machine learning um, in which the systems learn from observing data, um, just as humans learn from observing data and finding patterns within those data. Uh, and this uh, approach in machine learning was um, propelled significantly by advances in computing that made possible approaches that were actually much older um, called deep learning, but weren't really practical until computing became much cheaper and until there was an abundance of freely available data thanks to the internet. Um, so even though these methods go back to the like mid 1980s, these uh, deep learning methods, um, they really didn't find cost effective application um, until about a decade ago, uh, when the amount of compute uh, that was required was much cheaper, and until there was much more um, uh, abundant data on which to train these large models. What's happened in the last a uh, few years, and especially in the last um, several months, is that we found that particular kinds of deep learning approaches um, have uh, surprisingly a general uh, capability that can be applied across a broad range of, uh, of cognitive tasks, um, especially related to text, but also to, to imagery and, and even video. And so the um, the the work that's being done now in these so-called generative uh, pre-trained transformers or GPTs or large language models um, that are leveraging um, these transformers um, can be quite uh, capable. And for anybody who's worked with uh, a model like ChatGPT or Claude um, or some of the other models that are now uh, publicly available, um, some of the Llama-based models, these are uh, these are systems that really surprise users and their level of um, of sophistication, their their ability to generate reasonable answers across a broad range of of tasks. You just mentioned uh, GPT and the three phrases for the G, the P, and the T: generative, pre-trained, and transformer. Could you explain to us in a bit more detail? the three concepts that are behind those three phrases and how they played into what you're talking about, the capacities that were, uh, were, were generated. Yeah, so, um, right, so starting with generative, uh, this would be in contrast to discriminative models that, uh, that categorize things, that just sort of look at the world or objects in the world, text in the world, and put them into categories. Generative models create new things based on observing old things, looking at the patterns in old things. So in this case um, that we're likely to talk about with chatbots, um, generating new text based on observing um, old text. Um, Pre-trained uh, refers to um, training a, a general model in an unsupervised way on a huge volume of, of general text without, um, uh, without curating uh, the text or specializing uh, the model to be especially good at some uh, subset of text. So uh, uh, ChatGPT, for example, was trained on a significant part of the publicly accessible text on uh, the web. Um, it can then be taken and, and trained or fine-tuned on more specialized text. For instance, if you wanted uh, a specialized GPT, if you want a specialized model that um, does something specific, like writes Spanish poetry very well, you could take this general model and then do fine, -tune, fine tuning on um, examples of Spanish poetry. And you'd have to do less work to do that fine tuning to create a very capable Spanish poetry generator um, because you've already built this more general uh, text generator. Um, so that's the the pre-training part. Um, transformer is a a type of 
neural network that was introduced about five years ago that um, that relies on attention mechanisms, which is a way of um, focusing or assigning uh, more weight to particular parts of an input, uh, like a sentence. Um, and it turns out to be a, a very um, performative approach for, for natural language processing. So this combination generative pre-trained transformer uh, is uh, in combination a tool that's that's scalable um, because you 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 train it on um, every piece of sort of available text in an un, unsupervised way, meaning you don't have to uh, curate it and label it. Um, it's uh, it's generative, so it can do useful things like creating a uh, new text, um, and it's it's very good at um, at natural language processing thanks to the use of this transformer. And in combination, um, it can produce text that is um, really difficult to distinguish from human-generated text. Um, in fact, um, even experts in, across a variety of domains um, don't perform much better, and in some cases, um, you know, perform worse. Um, so it's uh, it's pretty striking in its in its generality and in it in its cost effectiveness. It costs a lot to train these models, you know, tens of millions of dollars to train a general model. But if you're if you're running the model, if you're typing um, a prompt, um, getting the the answer, you know, costs pennies, um, which is pretty amazing. During your time as White House Senior Advisor on Science and Technology, you worked on various policy issues, including AI. How do you believe your experience in policy development at the highest level has influenced your understanding of the societal implications of AI? And how does that inform your leadership at RAND? Well, I think one of the things that uh, that struck me um, in in working in policy in the government is just how little time you have to do analysis. Um, you're you're just trying to keep up with um, with the events of the day, and if it's in the White House, you're preparing, you know, either the president for a meeting with somebody, or or you're preparing the national security advisor for a meeting, and it's it's harder to do longer term planning and analysis. And so uh, one of the things that I love about RAND is that's that's our mission, is to ensure that we can do the policy and the policy analysis and long-term planning that's very difficult to do inside of government, uh, but in a way that can directly inform uh, decision makers within government, um, and in a way that has sort of privileged access to uh, the data and, and resources of, of government. So we're able to to serve as a think tank for the federal government in a way that um, that they can sort of outsource a lot of those kinds of uh, cognitive analytic tasks. Um, the other thing that was striking about um, about working in government is that uh, there's there's a need to get the really big things right um, because uh, you don't want to be surprised by learning after the fact that you could take one of these. Um, these GPT models and apply it to uh, use, you know, use it to develop a new cyber weapon or um, or a new biological weapon or some other type of um, of uh, of new technological threat. And so there's a um, there's a sense in which you have you really have to get like the existential threats right if you're in one of these policy positions. There's a lot that the market itself can work out. But the market is not likely to work out um, these these sort of overwhelming risks um, that uh, that aren't like going to be captured by market behavior. So you have to kind of look at what are the market failures um, in a technology area, and then think how can policy create guardrails. We do this for aviation safety. We do it for automobile safety, for drug safety. Um, and then we we do it across the board and in, in national security is just in thinking what are the implications going to be of some new technology and how do we ensure that um, the technology is not misused either intentionally or accidentally. I know you have just under 2000 colleagues doing what you're talking about. 
and that you're working with about uh, a half a billion budget annually. Uh, we're delighted that it's it's out our back door in Santa Monica and that we're neighbors in this process. It makes for you know, good good relating. As someone who's previously served as the founding director of the Intelligence Advance Research Projects Activity, an organization known for accelerating breakthroughs in AI and other advanced technologies. How has that experience shaped your perspective on the potential of AI and its impact on intelligence and national security? Well, the um, the impacts can be um, pretty profound in that you know there's a limited number of human analysts who can pour through imagery, for example, from from satellites. Um, or go through, you know, open source intelligence on, you know, news reporting globally in a variety of languages, and pick out the things that are really important um, for for policymakers to see in order to understand global events or global risks. So one of the um, the applications of AI inside the intelligence community is to do that sifting at scale very very quickly. Um, you know, go through imagery to find what are the things that have actually changed since yesterday. Is there a, um, you know, is there a new mobile missile launcher where there didn't used to be one? Um, are there uh, troop movements or tank movements? Um, and that sort of uh, that sort of analytic work of of imagery is like one natural place to apply AI, but also AI applied to to text um, and video and and audio. Uh, in order to ensure that analysts can focus their attention um, on the things that are that are most important and that require um, a human level of of sense making. So instead of figuring out, like instead of having analysts focus on what's changed since yesterday, have the human analyst do work that's right now not possible for an AI to do, which is really to understand why is there a mobile missile launcher there? And where is it likely to be tomorrow? What will it be doing? Um, that's, I think, the important part of this is kind of analytic triage. Switching out of the military for a moment, uh, your experience as a venture capitalist in the technology sector has given you firsthand exposure to AI startups and innovation. In your view, what are some of the most exciting AI applications or trends that have emerged in recent years, and how can organizations like RAND support and foster the growth of these technologies while addressing any associated risks or concerns? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that I'd I'd love to see the United States lead in in AI is an AI safety. I think it's a market differentiator. Um, if you think about um, our aviation industry or our pharmaceutical industry, the way that we became global leaders in those two industries uh, was because we led in safety. Um, we had, um, through, for example, the Air Commerce Act, uh, a set of, of standards and testing requirements for aviation um, that the government used that ultimately led to much greater levels of safety, much greater levels of consumer trust and confidence. And that then um, led to an aviation industry that had, um, in the United States, much lower accident rates than in other countries. Um, so our aerospace companies became uh, world leaders. I'd love to see the same in AI. I'd love to um, uh, ensure that the AI systems that are um, produced by our companies are the safest, most reliable, most trustworthy. And we're, we're doing some work here to help with that, first to help policymakers understand the kinds of standards and testing requirements um, that we could use in order to improve the systems that exist today and that will exist tomorrow, uh, and help the United States to be a market leader. Your involvement in establishing the National Counterterrorism Center demonstrated your dedication to addressing complex national security challenges. In your opinion, what role can AI play in enhancing counterterrorism efforts? And what are the unique considerations or challenges associated with AI applying in that context? 
Well, I, I can't take credit for the, the National Counterterrorism Center, um, although one of our, our trustees was a director of, uh, of that center. Um, I think one of the applications of AI that will be really important um, is uh, its misuse um, by terrorist groups. Um, cyber terrorism and cyber crime um, are likely to be amplified in some ways by, uh, by AI. Um, there's already some, you know, initial research showing how um, AI, these uh, chatbots can be used for uh, for effective spear phishing. Um, but they're also likely to be used in generating advanced malware um, more cost effectively because you can you can use these models for generating um, natural language, you know, human text, but you can also use it for generating, um, computer languages, so um, you know, coding for a piece of software, and the applications to cyber offense and cyber defense are likely to be really significant. And we don't understand yet which is likely to be advantaged more um, by AI. Is it going to be the offensive side or the defensive side? Um, one area that worries me a lot is is the application of of AI to um, to biological weapons. And, you know, unfortunately, there's still state biological weapons programs in the world. But there have also at, at various points been terrorist groups that have uh, been interested in, in biological weapons, and in some cases, pursued the development of biological weapons. Um, so if you had a group today that was similar to Elm Shinrikyo, you know, in the 1990s, which was a, a sort of apocalyptic cult in Japan that had a large budget, um, but didn't have access to, you know, today's level of, of biotechnology tools. If, if you had a group like that today with access to those biotechnology tools and access to AI systems that we've seen make uh, sort of breakthroughs in protein design, um, that could be quite dangerous. Uh, so I think that is an area of risk that we'll need to be really careful about um, in, the, in the upcoming years. As the CEO of RAND, what role do you see AI playing in shaping the future of society? And what are some of the key opportunities and challenges associated with its widespread adoption? Yeah, I, I think, um, I mean, one, I would really encourage uh, uh, folks uh, in the audience to um, to experiment with tools like Claude and, and Chet. GPT, if you haven't already, just so you get a sense of where the current frontier is uh, with these types of tools. Um, and I think these tools will become even more capable even more quickly in the years ahead, given the level of industry investment. Um, I think the the applications are likely to cut across virtually every part of um, of the economy, every part of society. Um, I think we'll see um, applications that are highly consequential in, in education. I mean, having things that are effectively digital tutors. Um, I already use uh, these models uh, to educate myself. I mean, I'll ask it to summarize articles, to point out, uh, to generate reading lists. Um, they're, they're just um, pretty well, uh, well uh, um, structured for something that will eventually become, I think, a a high-performing digital tutor, uh, but we can also imagine um, applications to uh, to biomedicine, um, to uh, to law, to um, to energy production, um, to science and engineering. Um, I think I don't think there will be places within our economy that aren't touched in some way by these uh, by these technologies, and that raises big questions then about. Um, uh, will there be labor displacement, um, as we've seen with, with previous technological revolutions? Usually when a new technology comes along, it actually produces more jobs than, than it removes from the economy. It creates entire new industries. Um, will we see that this time, or will the changes be so fast that there, aren't, there isn't sort of time for the jobs to shift from existing categories or, or occupations to new ones? And then there's also a question about to what extent some of these tools will be complements rather than substitutes in different categories of, of labor. 
And I'd say this is a, a, a pretty lively area of, of debate among, among labor economists. Um, right now, I think there aren't many wholesale categories of labor that are going to be displaced by these tools. It's more that these tools are used as a complement for these existing um, categories. So if if uh, if you're um, you know a um, an administrative assistant, you can use this to shorten a memo very quickly. You can use it to proofread a memo or to change the style of it or insert puns. Um, so it can be quite good for for doing. Um, uh, help with administrative tasks, but it still requires human editing because uh, it still makes mistakes. It still suffers from these hallucinations of, you know, fabricating things um, just based on um, uh, the sort of text that it's been exposed to as part of its original training set. Um, it it will sort of hallucinate um, uh, text that isn't real, um, but just as sort of similar to the things that it's been trained on. So that requires human editing, um, and I, I think for the foreseeable future, there will still be human roles in most of these key occupations. You've identified several important future applications of AI. How do we ensure these systems are safe and secure, and should they be regulated? If so, by whom and how? So first, we're seeing some encouraging signs um, by the companies themselves asking for regulation um, in areas where they're deeply concerned about safety and, and security. And I think we should take then those um, those messages with some level of uh, of uh, of seriousness, um, given that they're not only being made by um, executives at AI companies, but also by leading AI researchers. There was a, a statement signed um, a couple of weeks ago um, about uh, AI potentially uh, representing an existential risk, and it was signed by you know most of uh, the leading lights in AI research um, over the last decade, including many at the sort of key academic institutions. So it's not just an industry concern; it's also uh, a concern among um, academic researchers who are leaders in the field. All that means, I think, that we should be um, pretty thoughtful about what the risks are and how we avoid them. Some ways of avoiding the risks are to um, create guardrails in the way that we develop AI that can start with companies doing risk assessments before they train models. Um, you know, what are the possible risks of the model after developed? Um, how could it be misused? How could it be misaligned? Um, what are ways of reducing that risk? A second approach is um, uh, to do safety evaluations and red teaming uh, of the models. Uh, red teaming is where you sort of pretend to be a bad guy and then um, try to figure out how a bad guy would, would misuse a tool um, or try to break the tool. A third area is introducing know your customer screening um, for the uh, compute providers who are responsible really for um, the infrastructure that these models are trained on. So making sure that the folks who are um, providing the compute actually know who's using the compute to train these large models since these are now uh, cloud providers. Um, and do they have some sense of the safety um, assessments that were done in advance um, and the kind of safety testing that will proceed after development? Um, and then I think there's a need to, um, to think about the safety and security um, of the models after they're sort of, you know, in the wild. Um, but the challenge there is that if you have... Um, models that have been open sourced, there's nothing you can really do if you find out that there's a safety or security issue after the fact. So that's, I think, an area where we need to be really thoughtful and understand what should the sequence of open sourcing be. Like maybe there's an open source model only after you've um, done a lot of safety evaluations to ensure that it's, it's not going to be uh, really risky. And then the last thing I would mention is that the, the labs themselves need to have good security um, because uh, right now, probably one of the biggest risks we have to these models being misused is not that somebody will train a large model, 
um, and misuse it because it's so expensive, but instead somebody will steal a model that's already been trained um, and then misuse it. Bias in AI algorithms has gained significant attention, leading to potential discrimination in various domains. What strategies can organizations adopt to mitigate bias in AI systems? And how can policymakers play a role in promoting fairness and equity? So two things. One is that doing some amount of curation on the training data can remove um, data that is uh, that's biased uh, or toxic. And um, I think you know you could remove the text that's um, that's especially bad um, from the training data to make it less likely that the resulting model um, will be one that exhibits you know toxic behavior. Um, and this is now something that's that's consistently done. Um, there's also reinforcement learning with human feedback such that um, you can um, uh, you can reduce the weights assigned to uh, the parts of uh, of the inputs um, that are generating, you know, bad responses. Um, but one big challenge will be that uh, the training data on the web, um, it's so vast and it's not that the web has been curated. I mean, it's it's been produced by humans who have a range of biases and the models that come out of uh, that data um, will exhibit a lot of the same biases. Um, so, uh, you know, one one of the things that we'll need to do is figure out are there scalable methods of of curating the data and removing biases within it, um, and what counts as a bias is also going to be you know something important for uh, researchers and policymakers to um, to discuss. Uh, explain Rand's perspective on the role of AI in augmenting human capabilities rather than replacing human workers. How can AI technologies be harnessed to create a symbiotic relationship between humans and machines, ensuring a positive impact on the workforce? Yeah, I think first um, we, we probably need to have more exposure of more parts of the workforce to these tools, exposure that encourages people to think about how these tools can help them in their current jobs, um, you know, be a um, be an assistant. And, uh, you know, just as I use uh, these models uh, now every day to help me with with my job. Um, but, you know, we have administrative assistants here who use these tools. Um, we have researchers who use the tools. We have, you know, people in facilities who use these tools, people in our information services group. So we've got a lot of, of folks across RAND who are finding ways to leverage these tools in ways that help, not in ways that actually substitute for their jobs, because um, they really, these tools are not up to the level where it's going to replace someone. Um, it's it's really saving people time um, and uh, and in some cases improving the overall quality. I mean when I when I use it, for example, to do a, a lit review, it will point out things that I would have missed. Um, when I ask it to turn an outline into a first draft, it actually brings up points that um, I wouldn't have thought of myself. Now I can add in the points that I would have thought of that it didn't and I can remove some points that I think are are off the mark but it's a it's a pretty great you know generator um, for ideas and concepts um that uh that wouldn't have naturally occurred to me so i think more exposure is really useful more training is going to be really useful um and i think as uh as a society longer term we'll have to think about how do we help prepare uh, our workforce for these tools, um, including in the way that we um, provide STEM education. I mean, I think, you know, AI can both be um, uh, the sort of destination for a large part of STEM education, like how do we ensure that the future workforce is able to uh, to leverage these tools, but it, it can also be an input um, to STEM education in that we can, uh, we can be drawing off of these chatbots to be really good STEM digital tutors. 
Jason, you and I both have smart phones. Um, what can Pegasus do and ought we to be concerned? Oh, um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a variety of sort of spyware out in the world, and there's a variety of firms that uh, try to um, exfiltrate data from uh, from devices, from phones, from laptops, from home smart appliances. Um, th this is a, a market not just for cyber criminals, but also for um, for these kind of private intelligence organizations. Um, and I think it what steps we take to prevent that um, sort of depends on um, where we are, uh, you know, like which countries we're in. In some cases, we have um, levels of, of protection that are afforded by um, internet providers. In some cases, um, uh, the device companies themselves are trying to institute defenses. Um, and then there's, you know, software, of course, that you um, use on your on your laptop or on your phones um, that increase the level of security. There's some overall trends in society uh, that could improve privacy, uh, you know, things like advances in homomorphic encryption or federated learning, um, these kind of privacy preserving approaches to, to computation. Um, but it's it's sort of a, a constant cat and mouse in that every time a new advance is made on the defensive side, for example, in encryption, um, there's some company or another that figures out or, a, you know, some criminal organization that figures out some sneaky way to get to get around this stuff. Uh, so it's I think it's going to be a, a constant race um, between um, privacy and security and on the one hand and then, you know, kind of like cyber offense on the other hand. I think it's about time that we let our members uh, share their questions with you. Uh, so I would ask Rachel to uh, take it away from here. Thank you so much, Bob. And thank you to you both for being here. This is such an important topic and I know our members have a lot of questions about it. So the first, we've had a few questions come in about the EU's decision yesterday. So. How might yesterday's news of the European, European Union's AI Act impact our own efforts in the United States to legislate and regulate artificial intelligence? What do you think is the likelihood of an international agreement on AI safety in the near future? Yeah, thanks. I think that the, the EU um, AI Act is, uh, you know, has a, an emphasis on understanding a risk and figuring out what um, what safety requirements should be embedded within AI systems before they're broadly deployed. And I think the U.S. is sort of reaching the same um, uh, sense that we need some guardrails. Um, I think the U.K. is also, you know, reaching that same uh, sense. Um, whether there could be a uh, an international agreement around this, um, it's it's hard, of course, to get every country to agree to something. Um, usually, international agreements start with a smaller number of countries and then kind of build on, you know, more and more signatories. Um, uh, so, you know, the EU, the US, um, like the OECD countries uh, could be kind of naturals as uh, original set. Eventually, uh, you know, for, for AI safety to be something that is is globally uh, prioritized, um, China is going to have a really important role. Um, there's there's a lot of AI research in China; it's national priority. Um, and so, figuring out um, what are the areas of agreement um, between the OECD countries and China on AI safety is, is something that I think is, is ultimately going to need to be um, a priority. So our next audience member asked, given truth decay and its failure to base problem solving on facts and logic, we seem to be on a collision course with AI. How can Rand help with this? Yeah, I mean, AI can be an amplifier for some of the things that we're, we worry about in truth decay, uh, like disinformation attacks are things that can be made much more cost effective and uh, much more scalable uh, with the application of AI. You can generate text that's very hard to distinguish, um, you know, artificial from human, 
and if you um, and it's then very hard to filter out. So um, if you sort of like bombard social media with um, auto generated, um, you know, uh, fake content, um, that's going to be really hard to detect. And uh, and the forensics on this is extremely difficult. So there's been a, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's been a lot of interest in whether we can do certain kinds of watermarking um, in, uh, in media, like, you know, video, uh, in order to detect what's real from what's a so-called deep fake. Um, I think that uh, the information environment that we, that we have in the world that we use to make judgments and make decisions then gets a lot more complicated probably one intervention that's needed is just for everybody to have a, a higher level of skepticism about information that they're receiving primarily through social media. Um, because there's just a lot of information that's wrong. Um, it's really hard to do fact checking at scale um, with the content that we receive um, from social media. Um, and I think there there needs to be some restoration of accountability um, in journalism. Um, and probably some accountability for the social media platforms um, themselves. It's just extremely hard, though, to figure out what are the right guardrails there while we're also protecting uh, free speech. On a related note, our next audience member asked, do you see AI models being trained for political bias to be used in elections and distorting the truth? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we could Im imagine uh, disinformation attacks that uh, that influence elections, and I think that's among probably the greatest near-term risks of of these AI models applied to to text. Is that um, you could just have a a ton of of social media relevant to uh, an election, um, you know, discussions of. Um, of different political candidates' positions that might be misrepresented. Uh, we could also imagine there being deep fakes that are intended to embarrass um, a policymaker but aren't authentic. Um, so I think elections could be um, influenced this way. In some ways, um, you know, next year's presidential election in the United States um, is likely to be um, uh, a test bed um, for how strong our defenses are as a society against various forms of AI applied to the manipulation of the information environment used to inform the election. So switching gears a bit, what role do you see AI in enhancing our understanding of climate change and how can it be used on a practical applied level? Yeah, a few different places. Um, one is that there's some really interesting work that's been done in using AI to design energy systems. Um, there's some work at, at DeepMind, uh, which is one of the leading AI labs, used to understand how AI can be um, uh, used to design fusion, um, like, you know, the, the mechanisms for confinement of these um, uh, very high temperature um, fields that are, that are used for, for fusion energy generation. And then there's uh, there's similar applications um, of AI to other energy systems for figuring out how to, you know, optimize um, the generation and delivery and storage of energy. Um, there's also an application of AI to figuring to do uh, climate emissions monitoring, or sorry, carbon emissions monitoring. Um, so, you know, we have now some satellites that can monitor uh, carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions more generally. And it's a lot of data that's coming in. And if you want to estimate what are the trends in emissions globally, um, or if you want to do like change detection of, um, of permafrost um, or of, uh, of um, uh, you know, methane clathrates and the other things that are likely to be important for the future of, of climate change, um, AI applied to satellite imagery and other satellite sensing or other remote sensing um, is going to be really important. So you mentioned earlier the potential impacts of AI on the workforce. So this audience member asked, what should we expect from the integration of AI into robotic platforms? 
How significant are the implications for manufacturing, field maintenance, logistical support, et cetera, in both the civilian and military spheres? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's interesting that the physical world has been really hard for AI. Um, you know, there we have a we have intuitions in our brains about how to interact with the physical world. Um, and it it turns out that it's just really hard to learn that. Um uh that a lot that a lot of that is is probably hard coded into our brains from you know millions of years of of natural selection. Um and we uh we're still struggling to get um robots to uh to perform in an autonomous way um even in in fairly simplified environments so progress there has been a lot slower i think than people anticipated i think people sort of intuitively thought oh it's going to be a lot easier to train a robot how to like move a box than it would be to train a robot to like learn chess or go or you know some sophisticated strategy game. And in fact, the opposite is true. It turns out that like dealing with the physical world can be a lot harder um, than dealing with uh, these kind of abstract uh, strategic um, games. Um, so I don't I don't know how fast progress will be. I think part of it depends on how good the physics simulations will be that we now use to train um, some of some of these robotic systems. So if you, you can just do things a lot, lot faster if you can create a digital simulation in which you you train a system in a simulation that can run much faster than reality. Um, if you're training a system in the physical world, uh, then there's there's just limits to how quickly all that can happen. And you've got to build you know a bunch of robots in the real world that are costly in order to figure out um, uh, how to operate them. It's much, much faster and much cheaper if you can run them in a digital world that's a simulation. So some of these digital simulations now exist and they're they're finding that you really have to get like the parameters exactly right. Like, you know, the friction on a particular box, you know, if you want to move it, you really need to understand that with precision. Um, so as that work improves, I think we'll see improvements in robotics. So turning back to the conversation about possible regulations for AI, this audience member asked, how can a pause in AI development be considered when it's unlikely Russia or China will participate? So, I mean, at least to argue on the side of the folks who are, um, who are encouraging the pause, um, I think their, their argument would be twofold. Having had, you know, the sort of discussion with, with folks who encouraged a pause, uh, they said, well, number one, we're more than six months ahead of, of China um, and Russia. And I would definitely agree that we're far ahead, very far ahead of Russia. Um, China, I think, probably more than six months ahead. Um, the, the second argument would be it doesn't really do us any favors um, to be racing ahead if somebody simply steals our, our model. And so... Um, uh, you could say then that the um, uh, that racing racing ahead actually delivers our competitors an advantage because they can simply steal our model and then you know scale it up or more widely deploy it. So that those would be arguments I think in in favor of the pause. The arguments against the pause um, would be well, how are you going to use the six months exactly um, in order to you know increase safety or trustworthiness or the security of of these systems? I mean, one argument would be you use the use the six months to build greater security at the lab so that somebody can't steal the models. Um, but then also, while you're waiting six months, you've actually haven't learned that much about safety because it does require like interaction with these models in order to learn about what are the kinds of capabilities that they have, um, get the safety right in an interactive way. Um, and while you've waited six months, the, the compute has gotten cheaper so that if you then get kind of reintroduced into the world, actually these levels of capability would be higher and possibly less safe. So I think there's arguments on both sides. Ultimately, I think um, our attention probably shouldn't be focused on a pause and instead focused on building in safety and security while this ship is moving. Um, because I think that's that's going to be the thing that scales. 
So turning back to the technology for the last couple of questions, this audience member asked, to what extent are AI generative systems such as BARD or ChatGPT influenceable by individual users or by the targeted use by organized groups of people? Does this mean that the training window is effectively always open? Yeah, not not much. I mean, it's it's just really hard to influence a thing that is is being used, you know, by so many millions of of people. Um, I mean, you know, uh, the companies are ingesting the the prompt data as a way to refine their their tools, um, and they're also being retrained on on the web. So um, so you know, it's it's sort of like you could at least in principle influence the training of these models by influencing the text content that's on the web, but it's it's so vast, it's hard to have a significant influence on it. Um, I think there, there are ways of um, spoofing uh, these models. There's a, a kind of area of research um, called adversarial attacks. And we don't know very, we don't understand very well the ways in which the systems can be fooled. We've seen you know, various demonstrations of so-called jailbreaking uh, these models to get them to behave and um, in, in ways that are bad um, and figuring out more robust defenses to, to jailbreaking or to spoofing is probably an important research challenge going forward. And for our final question, you mentioned earlier, Rand is very involved in a lot of emerging technologies. So this audience member asked, what is the most important emer emerging technology that is currently not well known by the general public? I think, I mean, AI, of, of course, is one now that the public is is um, uh, paying a lot of attention to. I think we're probably still not paying enough attention to uh, synthetic biology and um, particularly the way in which over the last several years, the availability of tools and know-how has made it much more likely that somebody could um, design and deploy at scale um, a novel pathogen um, and potentially something much worse than, um, uh, than than COVID. And I think this is a real risk for society. We, we don't have strong guardrails around um, uh, uh, DNA synthesis. Um, and that's something that as a as a society we should be working on is figuring out what are the guardrails that we need in place so that somebody for less than $100,000 could, you know, reintroduce smallpox to the world. Um, I think that's a really important challenge and one that we're, where we're also working on at RAND. Great. Well, thank you so much. And again, thank you to our audience for submitting these questions and to you both for being here today. Such a great conversation. Um, Bob, I'll turn it back over to you and Kim to close us out. Well, Jason, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your involvement on our board, the service you're doing there, and the ideas you've generated for uh, for our council, and, and and looking forward to that continuing on for a long period of time. We're delighted that we're in your backyard, and you're in our backyard. We're very close uh, to your offices in Santa Monica and wish you the best of luck in the contributions that you and all of Rand are making to the society in which we we live in. Uh, Kim, Thanks you want to take it? Jason, that was just so fascinating. As you and I have spoken, so much of that is so exciting and so much of that is so concerning. But we're, as Bob said, we're so fortunate to have you at the helm of RAND and on top of all of these permutations and possibilities. So thank you for sharing with us. And we hope to have you back, hopefully in person, maybe with Bob moderating again and do some deeper dives into some of this fabulous research that RAND is doing. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kim. Thank you, Bob. Thanks to everybody for the great discussion. Mm -hmm.